Okay, uh, we said we'd speak about um, the problems of transplantation. With your permission, I'd like to do it in two stages. We'll start with the questions relating to um, <coughs> non-living donors, okay, where, where an organ is taken from a person who is no longer alive, and um, then, hopefully later, we'll talk about the question of... Uh, of living donors. Each of these areas poses two completely different sets of issues and then of course there are the factors that relate to the recipient which may be common to a lot of this discussion. Let me ask you to hold the questions <coughs> if you don't mind. While I try to lay out for you most uh, uh, comprehensively as possible some of the major issues <coughs> and then I'll stop for questions and you're welcome to, uh, to ask if I'm able I'll try to, to explain First of all, by way of introduction, I'm, I presume you're aware that transplantation surgery is a major uh, aspect of modern medicine. I don't know if you're aware of that. It's an everyday procedure. It's not um, sort of experimental anymore. There are major treatment modalities now that go around transplantation. Many organs are transplanted. Um, kidneys, for example, are transplanted every day, very commonly transplanted organ. The five-year survival rate for kidney transplantation is excellent, much better than 80%. <coughs> Even heart transplantation, which is much newer, <coughs> five-year survival rates are also excellent. So many organs are transplanted. Um, what is transplanted? Kidneys. <coughs> Today, livers or half livers are transplanted commonly. I'm not making a distinction now between living and non-living donors, but in general, livers are transplanted. Bowel and pancreas are transplanted. Lungs or lobe, a lobe of a lung. Today, it's not common to transplant a whole lung from a living donor because the morbidity and mortality to the, the donors is, is, is felt to be excessive, but lobes of lungs are transplanted, and non-living lungs d donations are, are certainly used. Um, um, bone, <coughs> bone is transplanted, skin is transplanted, corneas, the cornea of the eye, which has got its own unique halachic questions, those are taken and, and, and transplanted. <coughs> um, Today there is a, um, as you know, hearts are transplanted. They, uh, not that long ago, hands were transplanted, right? Hands, hands. Um, there is also talk now of a face being transplanted, right? In fact, there are <coughs> there is a serious move now. In fact, there's a team in this country, in Britain, that is poised and has been done done, done a lot of the homework and a lot of the uh, research work to enable them to transplant a face. Why would you want to transplant a face? No doubt you have your own personal reasons, but uh, <laughs> but the 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 real interest the real interest is in people who have very seriously disfiguring burns or other um, serious problems with the face. Tesla says that um, one of the classic commentaries that the psychological pain of not being able to go among people is a very severe form of pain, perhaps one of the greatest. Judaism recognizes psychological pain as if you could measure for measure, somehow if you could, if you could measure these things, then measure for measure, psychological pain is at least as great, if not greater than physical pain, if, if there were such a concept as a measure for measure, and therefore a person who cannot uh, find employment or marriage or simply cannot go among people because he has disfiguring um, facial facial problem like a serious burn or mutilating injury, injury let's say so there's a very serious um, very serious uh, moves have been made recently in terms of transplanting faces so transplant surgery is a real a real active uh, field of medicine particularly since the development of cyclosporine one of the major immunosuppressive suppressive drugs which enabled the the body of the recipient to tolerate many organs um, in conjunction with, with other drug um, aspects of drug regimens, people today can tolerate and live for many years with transplanted <coughs> transplant organs. There's also research going on in terms of transplanting eyelets of the pancreas so that people can overcome diabetes. There's research into <coughs> transplanting cells from fetal brains into patients with Parkinson's disease so they can manufacture the chemicals that are missing. There's all sorts of fascinating fascinating issues. So, transplantation is a reality. What are the, what are the issues that go around trans let's, uh, transplant? Let's try to divide this up into a number of uh, clear areas and see if we can understand what some of the issues and some of the problems are. I'd like to also try to cover some of the psychological issues governing the recipient and the donor as we cover the, <coughs> the various aspects. But let's begin with non-living donors and see what are the problems. 
When we talk about a non-living donor, we mean somebody's died, and now we seek permission to use their organs in order to transplant into somebody. A classical scenario would be, let's say, someone in kidney failure who is undergoing dialysis, <coughs> which is not a, which is often not a long-term, a very long-term proposal. If you've got a child in kidney failure, to keep a child on an, uh, in many, many years or decades of dialysis is problematic. Long-term dialysis has a very it has a, in the end, it, you, you end up with a, with a long list of uh, metabolic abnormalities. Eventually you get psychological changes. It's not a simple, <coughs> whichever form of dialysis you use is not nearly as um, appealing as receiving a kidney transplant, which enables many recipients to live, to live virtually normal lives for, for long periods of time. Same applies to livers and, and organs like that. So, so, what are the issues when you try to get organs from a a donor who's died, and you want to use those organs to transplant into a recipient. Well, <coughs> well, some of the issues are these. First of all, you know that taking, a <coughs> taking an organ from a dead body involves a number of Torah prohibitions. Mutilating a body, mutilating a human body, when you take parts of that body, you potentially transgress three Torah prohibitions. Okay? When the post-mortem is done, before we even talk about transplantation, a body, someone dies, and permission is given for an autopsy, and the, the, the pathologists are um, cutting up that body in order to find out the, uh, the, the cause of death, and they may take certain parts of the body either for certain testing or for transplantation, you are thereby transgressing three Torah prohibitions. Okay? The Torah prohibitions involved in this case are, first of all, mutilation of a body, that's called nivulames, when you actually cut up a body. The second is the taking of organs because there's a prohibition of benefiting from the dead. So when you're going to use part of a body for some positive purpose, that's called hanor, that's called benefiting from the dead. We are not allowed to benefit from the dead. And thirdly, there's a separate problem in that there's an obligation to bury a person and to bury all of them. <coughs> so when you're taking an organ, you're transgressing all three. You're mutilating the body when you cut it to take that organ. Secondly, you are having benefit from the organ. And thirdly, you are failing to bury that organ, right? So, how do we, how do we approach these three issues? Well, you know the general rule. The general rule is that if, if you're looking to save a life, then, in Jewish law, we will override virtually all other prohibitions. I presume you, you're aware of that. There are only three things you will not override. Sexual immorality, you have to know exactly what that involves. Idolatry and murder are three things you could not commit to save your own life. And I'm not going to go into the details now. However, when you're not talking about those three, you're talking about, um, you're talking about uh, <coughs> you know, uh, 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 other Torah prohibitions, and you wish to transgress them, then our priority is saving life. And therefore, we will transgress eating unkosher food, breaking Shabbat. Virtually everything else in the Torah will, pro will transgress in order to save a life. Is this, is this clear? And therefore, mutilating a body, is that one of the three primary cardinal issues? No. Is benefiting from a body one of those? No. Is failing to bury somebody one of those things? No. Therefore, we'll transgress all three of those in order to save a life. Just one sec. Can you ho hold your questions? Okay, I'll stop because and remember your question. The, the life we wish to save, of course, as I've pointed out in other discussions, the life we wish to save must be here now. We're not talking about research that may save lives in the future. We're talking about a real individual. But even if that individual who we wish to save is not clearly in danger, only they may be in danger, that's good enough in Jewish law. We don't use the concept of majorities when it comes to saving life. And not only that, but if I have somebody whose life may be in danger, and I can take an organ to save their life or do anything else to save their life, which involves a Torah prohibition, I don't even have to be certain that I'll save their life. That means, I do not have to be certain that they're in danger, and I don't have to be certain that I'll save them. Even a vague possibility that they're in danger, and a vague possibility that I'll save them if they are, is good enough in Jewish law, but there must be a real person. Okay? <clears throat> so, where there's a real individual whose life is in danger, or may be in danger, and I might be able to save him, then I will mutilate the body of the dead person in order to save their life. Now, let's discuss briefly these three prohibitions and see how they fit in. First of all, mutilating a body. Generally speaking, as we said, we'll override that prohibition and, and deform or mutilate the body in order to save a life. <coughs> the, the parameters involved in mutilating the body are like this. One opinion is, there are two opinions basically in, in halacha, in Jewish law, as to why you cannot mutilate a body. One of them is because the body is formed in the divine image. What's called Tselem Elohim. That means, although it has much deeper and higher meanings, nevertheless, one of the meanings of Tselem Elohim is that the human body is formed in a divine image. The body itself. 
since it's formed in the divine image, you cannot mutilate the human body. If you hold that that is the reason, and that's not the only opinion, but if you hold that's the reason why you cannot mutilate a body, this would apply to non-Jewish bodies too. Can you see that? Since a non-Jewish body is formed in the same image as a Jewish body, these authorities would make no distinction. They would say you cannot cut up a human body, Jewish or non-Jewish, because the prohibition here is the Salam al So far, so good? Okay. There's another opinion <coughs> that's got nothing to do with the Salam al but rather holds that mutilating of a body is rather connected to what we call Kavad al That means the dignity of the dead himself is affronted by mutilating his body. Okay? These opinions don't necessarily hold that autopsies or, or taking organs or mutilating bodies applies to non-Jews. In fact, that is the majority opinion we follow. We do not, we do not, we're not obliged in non-Jewish society to stop non-Jews from doing dissections on non-Jewish bodies. And that's why in a country like this, um, medical schools can use, or in the country, you know, in South Africa, where I trained in medicine, where we dissected a human body in great detail and use parts of bodies as, uh, you know, display, as um, uh, lab specimens and, and study material and so forth. There's no Jewish, we don't rule that that's a Jewish problem. In Israel, there are serious problems where the bodies that are used might be Jewish. But in non-Jewish countries, we don't rule that that's a problem. <coughs> However, if you hold that the mutilation of a body is an affront to the dignity of the person, then although you may not be talking about a Jewish-non-Jewish distinction, there'll be another problem. And there the problem will be, if you hold that mutilating the body is transgressing the person's honor or dignity, the authorities who hold that say that if it's your dignity, you can give it away. Which means, according to this opinion, if a person gave permission for his body to be used after death, there's no problem. Did you see that? Because if it's your dignity and you sign before you die and you say, look, I don't mind if they use my body for medical science, I don't mind about my own dignity, there are opinions that say, okay, that that's allowed because, can you see the wide-ranging argument here? The one position would say that it's not your honor that's at stake, it's the mutilation of the body. In that case, we will rule that Jewish and non-Jewish bodies are equally involved. However, to save a life, we'll take an organ, and we'll even take it against your permission. Why? Because your permission is not relevant. We've got saving a life and your opinion. So we'll definitely override your opinion to save a life. The other opinion will say exactly opposite. They'll say that mutilating the body is your dignity and it's your possession. And therefore, we dare not take an organ without your, without your permission. Incidentally, there's an interesting argument here. Some sources will say like this. Let's say you hold it's my dignity and I have to give permission. Okay? If I refuse permission, what's to stop you taking my organs anyway since you want to save a life? There are opinions that say like this. The reason you cannot take my organs even to save a life is because saving a life is a mitzvah and the dead have no mitzvahs. You want to come to my body and say, look, I'm going to take, we're going to take a kidney from your body to save a life, right? Saving life takes precedence of all else. Uh Uh-uh, not for a dead person. A dead person has no mitzvahs, not even saving a life. And therefore the dead person can theoretically say, I'm sorry, I want to be buried with all my organs intact. Don't tell me you've got a life to save. I'm not alive anymore. It's no longer my obligation. Okay, there's a position like that in Jewish law. So these are some of the factors that apply to the various attitudes towards things. The bottom line is, of course, <coughs> generally speaking, I'm not going to go now into the, the problem of the law of the land, where you require permission. That's usually, that's of course, um, in, in, ma- in many countries, including Israel, that of course is, is what's required. But provided that that's in place and permission is given, or permission by the family in certain circumstances, or a family testifying that the person in fact had given permission or would want to, that often is good enough, then we are using organs to save a life, even when we're transgressing these three areas, okay? Of mutilating a body, failure to bury the person, and um, <coughs> benefit from the dead. Mutilation of the body, I've discussed. Failure to bury a person, strictly speaking, an organ should be buried, right? Not only the body, but every organ should be buried. Technically speaking, the real obligation to bury an organ is when it is a limb of the body, which means it has bone, sinew, and flesh. In other words, flesh... Uh, you know, a, a bone, and also whatever sinew means, whether it's connective tissue or blood vessel, whatever it is, but you need three elements, in other words, like a finger or a hand, something like that, whereas simply soft tissue might be less, and therefore when biopsies are taken or parts of bodies are taken that do not involve a complete limb, there's not, strictly speaking, a real obligation to bury the body. Um, of course, a fetus that is fully formed certainly should be buried. In fact, there's even a Kabbalistic custom to um, perform a circumcision. I, I, when I moved from Israel to South Africa, my wife was uh, five months pregnant, and we lost the pregnancy, um, which was it happened to be an extremely beautiful little baby boy. 
And um, I actually had to bury the child, and beforehand I did a, I had to do a circumcision on this little child because that's the custom, right? Even though he wasn't alive, that is a custom, and you you do a, a breast on the child, and then the child's buried. And we have a very clear tradition that the um, child who's born, stillborn, fully formed, will be part of Tchias Amesim. Okay, will be part of the resurrection, and that is another whole whole discussion. So. So that is the custom, but since it's a fully formed child, not only a limb, so that, that child should be buried. So that is the question of thing. Now, bringing to burial is an organ like that, and also, <coughs> also is the question of all parts of the body that are lost after death. Let's just get this very clear, okay? Let's say a person dies, but parts of their body were taken before they died. Let's say there was bleeding. Okay? Let's say a person was injured and there was bleeding. And then sometime later they died. The blood that was lost before, or the parts of the body that might have been, you know, missing or cut off, is a different issue. But pa- any part of the body that is there after death, are you clear about this? In other words, here is a person who dies. <coughs> Subsequent to death, a part of the body is detached, or in death. Like, say, for example, there's some bleeding. We are very fussy to bury absolutely everything. This is why you'll see in these disasters and um, terrorist attacks, you'll see that there are people who go specially to try to pick up every possible little piece of, of human flesh or even blood, okay? In fact, we go so far, I know it's a, bit, it's a bit gruesome, but we go so far as that when a person's badly injured, such that in dying, there's bleeding, we don't even wash the body afterwards. You know, normally before a person's buried in Jewish law, they're meticulously washed, absolutely clean, nails are trimmed, and they, yeah, it, it, the body's absolutely perfectly cleaned in every way. Some communities, there are a lot of water poured over them. In some communities, the body's actually put in a mikveh before, de- before burial. However, if there are parts of the body that we are concerned about that were there at the time of death, and washing them or cleaning them might remove some of those parts, we don't even do that. In other words, it's absolutely important that all parts of the body are brought to burial. When an autopsy is required, either for the purpose of um, taking an organ or because the police require it or in some other way where, where we, cannot, uh, um, we cannot stop the process or, or in cases where Jewish law actually does agree, there we try to have knowledgeable people present so that the autopsy is done in the most respectful way possible and that every part of the body is actually buried afterwards. Nothing's washed away or um, if you ever walk, if you ever had the misfortune to have to visit a mortuary or work in one, you'll see it's actually quite a callous business. People who work there are not usually the most, um, you know, it takes a certain degree of, um, you, get, you get steeled and hardened by the procedure, and it can be a little bit. Uh, whereas, incidentally, people who work in the Hebrew Kedisha, there's a very, very respectful process. Women are preparing female bodies, men are preparing male bodies. And it's a very respectful thing where the person is very, very um, respectfully handled because of the, the dignity that's required to be. So that would be the problem of, um, of burying a person, and that we, we, would, we would set that aside when we're taking an organ in order to save a life. There are Kabbalistic questions about, let's say, a heart that's transplanted or a kidney. When that person dies, where should the kidney be buried? Should it be buried together with the recipient, or should it be removed and put back and buried with the donor? Okay, it's not done. In fact, the organ is left together with the recipient. There's no problem with that. It actually becomes part of their body, according to many opinions. Also, mechanical devices, like pacemakers, okay, usually end up being buried together with the <coughs> together with the recipient. In fact, it may even be deemed to be part of their body in certain ways. That's an issue. So, that is, those are the three prohibitions involved in taking donor organs <coughs> from non-living bodies. <coughs> the three basic categories. And of course, we will do that <coughs> where it's necessary <coughs> in order to save the life of the recipient. Now, one major problem, that's probably the major problem in this area, is when it comes to something like taking a heart. Okay, Let me try to explain this very carefully. This is probably the central... and most, uh, <coughs> most um, contentious issue. When organs are taken, let's say a kidney, so you cannot take an organ from a person who's living if that may cause them to die. I'm going to presume that you're clear about that, right? Let's say somebody is in a very t- uh, <coughs> dangerous situation, let's say they're terminally ill, and you wish to do something like take an organ from them. Okay? There, the problem is, of course, if you're going to take an organ, even I'm not talking about a heart, I'm talking about a kidney, you subject somebody who's dangerously ill to the surgery to take a kidney, that may well kill them. And therefore, of course, you cannot do that. When you can take the organ is at a stage when they've died already. The problem is, of course, at which point are they deemed to have died. That's the problem. Well, Jewish law, basically, the normative position is that the person's diagnosed as dead when heart and breathing stop, and then you wait a certain period of time. Okay? 
we are looking basically for non, that means irreversible, cessation of cardiorespiratory function. Once the heart and lungs have stopped functioning, and you've waited some time, okay, I'll explain in a moment, then you can proceed to take the organs if you need in order to, <coughs> to save a life. How much time do you have to wait? The custom in most communities is to wait about half an hour. Different customs in different Jewish communities, the Hebrew Kedisha have different customs. In some places it's 20 minutes, in some places half an hour. The minimum that's ever been allowed, even for taking of an organ, by any halachic authority, is probably five minutes. Okay? Now, you know that five minutes after a person dies, the organs, without any oxygenation, without any blood flow, without any circulation, all the organs become unusable. Okay? In other words, a person has died and no one's attempted to resuscitate them or keep their circulation going. Four or five minutes later, you will not be able to resuscitate them. And after that, you can... Then, I'm talking about a situation where you're not obliged to resuscitate. Of course, many, many times a person dies, Jewish law would require you to try to save their life and get them, get them going again. But in circumstances where you're not obliged to, <coughs> for example, in a brain death scenario, where it would be permitted... In, uh, yeah, in those situations where you're permitted not to resuscitate, then you are free to wait... I'm not, I'm not, again, we'll have to discuss brain death, it's a complicated issue. But then you are free to wait a certain amount of time. After that amount of time, you can then proceed to touch the body and, if necessary, remove an organ. Okay? By the way, this four or five minutes only applies in circumstances where all else is equal. For example, where a person has got certain drugs in their, system, in their, in their circulation, or where they've been exposed to extreme cold. Okay? For example, in cold water drowning then a person can sometimes very fully be resuscitated m- after much more than four or five. Are you familiar with this? For example, sometimes a child who falls into an ice-cold swimming pool in winter, children have been recovered from the bottom of swimming pools after eight or ten hours of immersion and completely successfully resuscitated. The reason is that the rapid cooling of the organs, especially the heart and the brain, uh, arrests the metabolic activity. Okay, and you can resuscitate a person very successfully. That's why, that's why when a child is pulled out of the water, especially cold water, nobody gives up the resuscitation for a number of days. Because sometimes you can win the battle even many hours or days later. <coughs> even adults have been known to fall into the North Sea, for example, in freezing conditions, and they've been fished out of the water, virtually frozen, and resuscitated very successfully, even though there's been no breathing for lengthy periods of time. In fact, in heart surgery, one of the techniques that's used in open heart surgery is the body is cooled. It's not cooled to freezing, but it's cooled well below normal body temperature, and it gives you a long period of time in which you can operate without damage to the tissues, whereas if they were normal temperature, you would not have that amount of time. I'm, talk- I'm not talking about those situations. I'm talking about situations where, under normal conditions, you've waited a certain amount of time, under normal circumstances, and then you are allowed to touch the body. Now, now the problem is like this. The heart is not susceptible. You cannot wait four or five minutes and then take a heart. Okay? The reason is that certain tissues in the body are much more metabolically active than others. And if you wait that period of time without any circulation, they become unusable. The heart is so metabolically active that if you wait even a short period of time after death, the heart no longer will function. The cells have begun to become damaged. And when you take that heart and try to implant it into somebody else, it will not function. The only way you can perform a successful heart transplant, basically, is when you open the chest of the donor while the heart is still beating. Okay? And then you stop the heart yourself by injecting a certain preservative type of uh, cardioplegic solution, which preserves the function of the cells. You rapidly cool the organ in a uh, bath of cold cardioplegic solution, and then you transport the heart and transplant it into the recipient and then warm it up again. Okay? That is how hearts are done. If you follow Jewish law and you take the heart after you've waited, it will not be useful. Can you see the problem? When it comes to other organs, for example a kidney or even a lung, you can wait. In fact, I spoke to Professor Joel Cooper, who's one of the world's leading lung transplant surgeons uh, in St. Louis, happens to be Jewish. He told me that when they transplant lungs, the the, the post-mortem time, in other words, the time that the lung lasts after death till you harvest it, is not as critical as the last phase of life when there may be a very low slow a, a, a very low flow state of blood in the lung, that can damage the prospects for, for transplantation more than the time, this, this fully ischemic time that you wait after death has ensued. Each organ's got its own parameters. But many organs like kidneys, and certainly organs like bone, the cornea is no problem at all, right? The cornea, it doesn't have a blood supply. The cornea does fine. You can take a cornea from a dead person and transplant it into a living person. It takes fantastically. There's very little problem. Bone is also like that. Skin is also not so, not such a problem. But when you get to organs that are highly metabolically active, like a heart, you cannot afford to wait. 
Now, when you take kidneys, there's no problem. What we do in Jewish law is, where a kidney is taken, wait till the person has died, we are then waiting the required period, and then you can harvest the organs and take them and they will do fine. The problem is you can't do that with a heart. So, what is done in the case of heart transplants? Well, when heart transplantation began, okay, and let's not forget in which country <coughs> heart transplantation began. Um, when heart transplantation began in 1968, um, the very great dilemma was, of course, a heart was taken from a donor, okay, who was brain dead, and his heart was beating. At that time, the moral issue had not been settled, and of course, it raised massive debate. There was a lot of criticism, in fact, of the first, of the first transplants. But the, the idea of transplanting hearts, when it became demonstrated that you could save people's lives this way, the problem became, how can you take the donor heart while it's beating in order to save a life? If you do that, you're killing the donor. If you live in a society where the definition of death is cessation of spontaneous heartbeat, and therefore the person's heart is still beating, and therefore they're not dead, you open the chest and stop the heart beating, you just kill the donor. In fact, Rav Moshe Feinstein ruled that the first transplant, when he was asked about this from a Jewish point of view, he ruled that it was double murder. He said it was murder of the donor, because you took a beating heart, and murder of the recipient, because who says he's going to live any longer with a transplanted heart than he would have with his own heart? when it was experimental. Later, he revised the ruling to make it permissible for the recipient when it was demonstrated that you could very well save his life, but he never changed his mind, and uh, this is a, a vexed issue, we'll have to discuss it, about the donor, okay, giving the donor heart. And that pretty much is the norms of position in Jewish law today. If you need a heart as a recipient, you can receive the heart. If you want to take the heart from the donor for that recipient, you can't take, the, you can't take it because you'd have to kill the donor to take his heart. Okay, that's the idea. So what happened was, the history is as follows, very briefly, very briefly, the history is like this. Uh, in fact, the way hearts are taken today, it's a pretty gruesome business. The way it's often taken, I have a friend who's an anesthetist in Los Angeles, and he told me, he discussed with me a very uh, difficult situation, is that the anesthetist is sometimes, what, what in America they call the anesthesiologist, right? We call anesthetist. He is called in to give metabolic support while they strip organs. What happens is they have a person who's brain dead, they certify the person brain dead. The ventilator keeps the ventilation going. The heart beats by reflex activity and keeps the circulation going. And the anesthetist is called in to support those bodily functions while the surgeons open the body and take all the organs. They take a liver, they take lungs, they take uh, kidneys, they take a heart. <coughs> and, the, and the anesthetist, right, he's a very, very difficult and gruesome business of trying to support what remains of the body metabolically to make sure that the freshness of the organs and their viability is maintained. Okay, this is not a simple matter from a Jewish anesthetist's point of view because he's required to assist in a situation where a heart is being taken, organs are taken while the heart is still beating. This critically depends on the definition of, of death as brain death. But the history is as follows very briefly. What happened was in 1968, <coughs> in 1968 shortly after transplantation began, right, within, within months of the first transplant, the Harvard, in, uh, Harvard University convened a committee to decide on criteria for death. You understand that the, the issue was, could we now change the definition of death? And instead of saying that life depends for its definition on heartbeat and respiration, could we say that the definition of death is now brainstem function? If you could prove that there's no more brain function, while the heart beats ref from a reflex point of view, yes, you know that the heart will continue beating on its own. You know that. If you take a heart out of a human body and put it in a, in, a, in a correct environment, the heart will continue beating on its own. The heart has its own intrinsic pacemaker and it will continue beating on its own. In fact, you can take a few heart cells and put them in a dish and they carry on beating. Take a few heart cells, muscle fibers, and they keep, they keep contracting. Okay? They've got their own intrinsic pacemaker. <coughs> but breathing will not continue because breathing depends on the brainstem. Yes, you can stop your breathing if you wish. Right? You, can, you can hold your breath. You can breathe fast. You can breathe slow. It's under control of the brainstem. When the brain stops, the breathing stops. But the heart doesn't. The heart continues beating by reflex activity. Eventually the heart stops because there's no breathing, so there's no oxygen. So the heart doesn't get oxygen, so it stops. So they said like this, can we possibly define death as brainstem death, which means the person will stop breathing, but we'll keep the breathing going by a ventilator, and the heart will beat automatically. If we could define a person like that as dead, then great, we could cut open the chest, take out the beating heart, because no problem, the person's dead. So they convened a committee at Harvard to try to define criteria for death. In fact, the committee said they found it a very difficult task. You might think that diagnosing death is one of the simplest, simplest things, right? 
But in fact, it turned out to be an enormously difficult task. What happened was, the Harvard Committee came up with a set of criteria for what they called irreversible coma. Irreversible coma means <coughs> that if you have all the requirements for brainstem death, and they are very well worked out, okay, you, you look at various reflexes, corneal reflexes, uh, you look at you look at, um, you put cold or hot water in the ear, and you see if there's any eye movement to what's called nystagmus. There are very uh, elegant ways you can test certain brainstem reflexes. And of course, the main one is what's called apnea testing. You detach all the machines, and you see if there's any effort made to breathe. If there's any effort, any respiratory effort, then of course the brainstem is alive. But if there's no effort made to breathe, under very carefully controlled circumstances, for example, you have to be sure that there's a low enough oxygen level in the blood, there's a high enough carbon dioxide level, all the things that would normally make a person try to take a breath, if all those conditions are present, and again, there's no drugs to explain the problem, the person's not cold, when all things are normal, and there's no effort to breathe in circumstances that would definitely guarantee the effort to take a breath, that is called a positive apnea test. In some countries you have to do apnea testing um, to, uh, 24 hours apart. Some countries require at least two doctors to be present. Some countries require three. Some countries require at least one of the doctors performing the tests to not be one of the surgeons on the transplant team in case they have a vested interest to define death a little bit uh, you know, b- b- rashly so they can you know, get these nice fresh organs. Different countries have, to have, different, have different rules. So... Those are, so Har- the Harvard Committee came up like this. They said, if all these conditions are present, apnea, testing, etc., etc., and the brain stem has died, we can guarantee you that that's a non-reversible coma. Don't ask us about death. Yeah, death is beyond our capacity. That, that, that's a spiritual question. That's ask the rabbis, ask the priests. I don't know. That's a religious question. But medically, we can tell you, this person will not recover. And it's very, very widely accepted today in modern medicine that if the, ap- if the, if the brainstem death criteria are fulfilled, that person will not recover. In fact, I'm not aware of any case, I'm not aware of a single case, where valid criteria for brain death were established, brainstem death, and the person recovered after that. It's a very good definition of irreversible coma. Are we together? The only problem is, is is irreversible coma death? The normal scenario is, you diagnose brainstem death, what, what that means is the heart is beating by reflex activity, the ventilator machine is keeping the breathing going, there's absolutely no brainstem function, okay? there, there may be certain function of the brainstem like temperature regulation issues, some of those could continue, but basically the brainstem that governs breathing is no longer functional, and what happens is if you keep the ventilator going, eventually the heart stops. Eventually the heart does stop. No one is exactly sure why. If you make a strenuous effort to maintain internal homeostasis, that means you make sure that the blood pressure is good and you make sure that all the nutrients and oxygenation and all the things that are needed internally are there so that the heart has what it needs, it usually stops within a short period of time. Usually two or three days later, the heart stops. If you ask the neurosurgeons, they cannot tell you exactly what causes the heart to stop, but sooner or later it does. There are one or two recorded cases of a heart continuing to beat for 27 days or 29 days in unusual circumstances, but ultimately the heart does stop. Okay? <clears throat> now, the question is, before the heart has stopped, while it is yet beating re- by reflex uh, activity, and you are keeping the breathing going, and the brainstem is dead, is the person at this point called dead? So the Harvard people said, we cannot diagnose, we cannot define that, all we can tell you is, this is a set of criteria that define irreversible coma. In 1980, a President's Commission in the United States decided to accept br- uh, irreversible coma criteria as a legal definition of death. Okay? They said, this has gone far enough. Uh, transplant surgery is advanced enough that we need to make a decision. From now on, we're going to recommend that the legal criteria for death not be cessation of heartbeat and respiration, but brainstem death. What was previously called irreversible coma shall now be called death. Rapidly thereafter, the United States, all of the United States, accepted the legal definition of brainstem death, and today that is the law in the United States, it's the law here in Britain, it's law in South Africa, it's law in Israel, right, which is not in accordance with, certainly not with all halakhic opinion, but that is the universally accepted criterion of death today, and the patient is diagnosed as dead when the brainstem is dead. Therefore, once you can diagnose brainstem death accurately, whether you do the apnea testing or you do it two days apart or six hours apart, whatever they require, you can then legally uh, terminate the ventilator 
Oh, yeah, or you can keep the ventilator going, open the chest and the abdomen, and take out all the organs, and the fact that the heart is beating is only a reflex phenomenon, and it's not diagnostic of life. Is, is this clear? The question is, in Jewish law, in, hal- in halakha, is that valid? Is that valid? Well, there's a very vexed argument about this, which, con- which continues to the present day. There's a certain there's opinion in, in America and New York, and it's agreed this opinion is held also by certain of the judges on the Israeli chief rabbinate, they hold that brainstem death is a valid criterion for death. The majority of halachic authorities um, hold that it's not a valid criterion. The Jewish law requires cessation, irreversible cessation of cardiorespiratory activity. The heart must stop and the breathing must stop before we can, with other criteria, before we can diagnose death. There's a very interesting debate in the Talmud. Is it breathing or heartbeat that's the main one? Are you familiar with this? The Gemara says that if a person is buried alive on Shabbos, let's say a house collapses and a person is buried under the rubble, we don't know if the person is alive or dead. Can you break Shabbat to try to save a life like that? <coughs> of course. So what you do is you start digging. The question is, at what point do you have to stop? Because you're breaking Shabbat now, okay, to dig this person out. At what point do you have to stop? Well, when you've uncovered enough of them to see that they're dead. Correct? Is this right? Now the question is, how much of them do you have to uncover to be sure that they're dead? So there's two opinions. One opinion is, get to his nose and see if he's breathing. The other opinion is, get to his chest and see if his heart is beating. Then the Gemara says, well, actually this is not an argument. It really depends on which side you started digging from. You see, is is the revival team, what do you call them, the rescue team, did they start digging through the rubble from his feet up? Then maybe they can stop when they get to his chest. Or maybe they're digging from the head down and they can stop when they get to his nose. Do you understand? So, the bottom line is, we actually rule in practice that you really need heart and heartbeat and respiration to stop. There's a learned debate about which one is primary and is the other one only a sign? Yeah? Is the heart beating only a sign that there's breathing or vice versa? The Hassam Sosa speaks about this. There are, there are sources that deal with this. The bottom line is, we need to know that the person has no heartbeat and that they are not breathing and then we have waited some period of time. How is there a possibility of saying that brainstem death is valid criterion? Is there a Jewish way to say that? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And don't forget what hangs in the balance here. What hangs in the balance is the availability of taking hearts for transplantation. If you hold with the old definition, the, the old halachic definition, you can't take hearts for transplantation. If you take the new definition of brainstem death, then you can take hearts for transplantation and we can save lives. So there's a lot of motivation here, okay? The problem is, is it valid in Jewish law? And nothing could make more a bigger difference. If you say it's allowed, you're doing the mitzvah of saving a life. If you're saying it's not allowed, you're killing the donor. And there's not much bigger of errors than killing somebody. Okay? You hear the, you hear the difference. We're talking about real life and death issues. Well, the minority opinion is that you can take the heart while it's beating because brainstem death is a valid criteria. Let me try to explain to you how they come up with this, with this idea. The logic is like this. Again, it's a bit gruesome, but... Uh, to explain like this. The Gemara makes it clear that if the, if the head is not present, the head is not present, the person has been decapitated, okay, then they are dead even if the heart is beating. Are we together? Someone's walking along and suddenly their head gets cut off, right? Head's cut off. And you run over to the body and you notice that it's moving. The body's moving, it's twitching, it's got reflex activity, including heartbeat. They will count, continue for a very, very, very short period of time but it may continue for, yeah, during that time. During that amount of time, the person is dead. Can you see where we're heading? That means, even though the heart is beating, if you know it's only reflex activity, for example, the person is for sure dead. Why? They've got no head. Okay? Where's, the, where's this case? I'll tell you where this arises. It actually arises in a serious case. The Talmud discusses the case of a woman who's pregnant, who dies on Shabbos. Here's a lady in late pregnancy, and she dies on Shabbos. Can you go and fetch a knife? and carry it through a public domain, Rosh Hashanah, in breaking Shabbos, to cut open her abdomen and save the life of the child. Now, an unborn fetus, we will break Shabbos to save the life of a fetus, okay? Even though the fetus does not have the same status as the mother, and the mother's life takes priority over the life of the fetus, but nevertheless, all else being equal, we certainly do everything we can to save the life of the unborn child. So we'll take a knife, and we'll transgress Shabbos, and we'll cut open the womb, perform a post-mortem cesarean section in order to deliver the child and save the life of the child. So far, so good? Okay. The late authorities say like this. No, there's one exception. The exception is like this. Today, we no longer have adequate 
adequately sophisticated diagnostic criteria to know that the mother, in fact, has died. Let's say this mother falls down and you run home and she's got no pulse and looks, she looks like she's dead. Are you sure? Maybe she's extremely deeply comatose and she's, and she's got very, 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 very faint vital signs and you are not slick enough or sensitive enough to pick them up and you cut open the abdomen to take the child out, you may well be killing the mother. Okay? Do you realize, of course, that this would apply whether it's Shabbos or not? This could be Tuesday. Right? I don't care whether it's Shabbos or not. Any day of the week, if you're going to cut her open to save the child, and you may well be killing her, we are not accurate enough. There's a very interesting modern opinion that says that nowadays we can be sure. Because nowadays we can be very, very sophisticated in terms of ECGs. We can use electronic uh, diagnostic criteria. Today we can be absolutely sure that there's no vital activity. And therefore today the obligation would be if you could diagnose with that degree of accuracy, then you would cut open the womb. However, let's put ourselves in that scenario where a woman dies, and we're not 100% sure that she's dead. We would be very hesitant to cut her open in case we kill her. But how about a woman who's decapitated? Do you see the argument? Here's this war lady walking along. She's very heavily pregnant. She's almost about to give birth, and suddenly she's decapitated. The head is not attached to the body. Could you then break Shabbos to cut open the abdomen to save the child? Yes. Of course! The question about, yeah, be, the, you don't even have to consider whether her heart's beating or not. Why? Because that is the adequate definition of death. Now, comes along these latter day authorities and they say like this, brainstem death is physiological decapitation. Brainstem death is the same as the head being absent. Do you see the connection? If there's no blood flow to the brainstem and there's no brain activity, so that is the same as the head being absent. Do you buy that argument? Well, that's what they advance. It's a very clever argument. And they say, therefore, we should be able to diagnose brainstem death as death because it's exactly the same as the head not being there. What's the difference if it's not there or it's not working? That the brain is completely irretrievably damaged. There's no blood flow at all to the brain. And therefore, we could diagnose it. The problem is, the other side of the argument says, that is not decapitation. You may be right that the brainstem is not functional. There's no blood flow to the brain. That's not the same as the head being absent. It's, it's functionally and physiologically very different. When the, brain's, when the brain is there, but not functioning, the heart continues beating, the blood pressure is maintained, all sorts of things are happening. When the head is removed, the blood pressure drops instantaneously. <coughs> it's a completely different phenomenon. <coughs> and therefore they argue that brainstem death is not the same as the head being absent. Did you see this argument? The present state of the argument is that there's a minority opinion that holds that we ought to accept brainstem death. The reason being that it is a valid criterion and will save lives. The other side says, you are killing the donor. True, you're killing a donor who's inevitably going to die. And true, it may not be actionable as murder, okay, because the person may be considered a traitor. It's all interesting discussion what the person is, but that's called spilling blood. And you're not allowed to fall short in the life of an irretrievably, irreversibly comatized individual, not even by a moment. And therefore, generally speaking, you cannot take hearts for transplantation. Okay, that is the main issue, the main, uh, the main thing going around transplanting hearts. Now, don't get this wrong. We're not only talking about hearts. If you live in a country where they take kidneys by the same criteria, how do they take kidneys today? They don't wait till the heart stops. They use the same definition. For that matter, they switch all ventilators by that definition. When the person's brainstem dead, the neurologists or neurosurgeons will examine the patient and they'll say, look, the patient's brainstem dead. Therefore, what's the point of keeping the machine going? Okay. Because the person is by definition dead. You're just keeping a body functional. They only keep the ventilator going to keep the organs perfused so you can use them for transplantation. In Jewish law, of course, the majority opinion is that the person is not just being perfused. The person's alive. Okay? And therefore, and therefore, we would not switch off that machine or rather strip those organs okay, on the basis of brainstem death as a criterion not for the heart and not for the other organs. Incidentally, this is why a blanket permission to use your organs after death is problematic in Jewish law. If you sign your driver's license, you know, you, in some countries you carry a card or your driver's license and you sign permission on the back for your organs to be used after death. A Jew should not sign blanket permission for that in a country where they will take your organs, okay, when they reckon that your brainstem has ceased functioning, but your heart is still beating. Okay, do you understand? That may very well, according to our majority of halachic greats, going, yeah, it may be very well going against Jewish law. You have an option in some countries to sign your driver's license in such a way that says that you may only take my organs on condition that a halachic authority is consulted. Sharet Tzedek Hospital, for example, has a, a donor card which says 
My organs may be taken only under the following circumstances. Number one, the following organs, and you tick which ones you want. And number two, under valid halachic guidance. Okay, that is a, um, a safeguard in Israel, where things are not medically done according to Jewish law. Here's a safeguard that in this circumstance they will be. Or I must also point out in countries where the law is going to change, okay, in this country it's been mooted a number of times, that they change the law to make every citizen by default have agreed to give his organs, unless you sign refusal, okay, many, the, the claim is in many countries they cannot get enough organs because not enough people donate their organs. Let's make the law that we can use anybody's organs unless they explicitly refuse permission, then Jews should refuse permission to give the organs, unless you stipulate very carefully the correct halachic criteria so that Jewish law will be respected and they will not just use secular criteria for things like diagnosing death when it may be well, well be against Jewish law. Okay? These are some of the basic issues in terms of donor surgery. I'd like to discuss next the question of the recipient. What are the factors that govern the recipient? I'm not going to do that this evening. And what are the very, very different issues that govern taking organs from a donor who's alive? Okay, that's a completely different set of issues involving the psychology of the donor, the psychological coercion or pressure put on a donor who may wish to refuse, but may be forced to agree. These are all sorts of fascinating issues that are still to be discussed. What are the questions on, on the stuff we've actually covered? And I'll do my best to try to cover them. Yeah. Um, you said before about you're allowed to... Um, break any Torah prohibition to save life? Virtually any prohibition. Virtually, yeah. Um, but you know about not being, uh, gaining benefit from a dead body? Yeah. When else, um, we can't think of any example, when, when you would gain benefit from a dead body other than save life? Well, you might want to do research on the organ. Okay, you might want a piece of a body to do research. Saving life, oh, that's not saving a life that's in front of me now. That's the criterion. That's saving lives in the future because I'll get medical knowledge that may well add towards knowledge that will save lives. In Jewish law, that's below the red line. If you want to save a life in Jewish law and break a Torah prohibition to do that, show me the life you want to save. That's called the Chele Lev Fanenu. We've discussed this principle under the heading of um, critical decisions in triage where you can only save yeah, you can only save one life, who comes first? Whenever we want to, and I went into it in detail there, whenever you want to break a Torah law to save a life, yes, we'll break the law, but show me the life. You don't have to prove to me that the person is certainly in danger, and you don't even have to prove to me that you'll certainly save them, but show me the person. Yeah, please. Um, isn't it possible to say when, when a Shema needs their body? And isn't a around 40 to 70 days after that anyway? What's the problem? The person's dead when the body... No, let's get this clear. The person's dead when the neshama leaves the body. When does the neshama leave the body? When they're dead. Now, at which, since you don't see the neshama, at least most of us don't see the neshama kind of floating out of the body, the question is, at which moment does that neshama leave the body? Well, the halacha says, when the halachic criteria for death are satisfied. Namely, when the heart and breathing stop, and then some minutes later, possibly, Okay. The fact that the neshama, when it leaves, hovers over the body, has got nothing to do with death. Kabbalistically, you're quite right. The neshama hovers over the body, and very painfully, in fact, until burial. And then it starts to get the feeling of what it means to be adjusted to a situation where the body no longer responds. And then there's interesting Kabbalistic discussion in which it says that the soul, the neshama, goes between the grave and the home for seven days, backwards and forwards, trying to find out where it actually belongs. It's a whole discussion. It's got nothing to do with the definition of death. So if you could know when the soul leaves, not by reference to these criteria, that might well be good. But we don't yet have that, you know, like a neshama meter, you know, that you kind of hook up and shows you when the thing, when it floats out, so until, until such, yeah. Right, you said you're not allowed to murder to save a life. Yeah. But is taking your own life murdering yourself? Yes. Then you're not allowed to take your own life, not even to save another life. You can't kill yourself. Killing yourself, suicide, is in the same category as murder in Jewish law. Okay? Because you're not allowed to kill a person. You are also a person. In fact, your obligation is to take, take care of your own life even more than anybody else's. If you could only save one life, yours or somebody else's, yours comes first. Could you sacrifice your life to save a whole community? Or many people? Yes, that's called the Kiddush Hashem. That happened many, many times. Yeah, where a person gave themselves over. The Talmud has a famous case of two brothers called Papas and Lulianus. When the Romans found somebody killed and they accused the Jewish community in Lut of having killed him, yeah? and they said they'd kill the whole community unless the criminals were found, these two brothers stepped forward and falsely said that they were the killers, 
and the Romans killed them. The Talmud says they guaranteed a place in the next world, even though they gave up their lives, because they did it to save the whole community. That's an incredible thing. That's called the Kiddush Hashem. But you could not commit suicide voluntarily, because that is... Um, suicide is a form of taking a life, and that's not allowed. Yeah. Um, you said if, if they were going to automatically assume that they could take the organs, we'd have to have something that said that we don't want them to. Right. But... You know, could you carry such a card on Shabbat, or what? You know? No, but but again, if you let, let's this donor card that you're carrying on Shabbat, right? Whatever the donor card says, whether it's the way the law is now or when they change the law, we don't carry a wallet in any right. cards on Shabbat. But but then let's get this right: they would not be allowed to take organs unless they had found that card. And, and presumably when the law changes, which means that they can take anybody's organs, they'd have to ascertain that the person had not signed refusal. Mm-hmm. They couldn't just take a body on Shabbat without any knowledge of whether this person's refused or not. They have to contact the next of kin and find out what's doing, okay? The Jewish community would raise extremely strong objections. If they assumed a default position without checking whether the person had agreed or not, that would be, that would be problematic. Also, we're hoping very strongly, of course, that other options will open up. There's research going on in animal organ transplantation. There's a lot of research, although it's uh, very early days. There is research going on now in stem cell, stem cell research where the hope is that we'll be able to grow human organs rather than transplant them. We may, the hope is even that we'll be able to trans- grow organs from the person themselves by stem cells that might be taken when they're born. All sorts of hopes like this where there will not only be no problems of rejection, there will not be spiritual problems either and that will be far preferable to all these types of Issues. Animal transplantation raises all sorts of other issues, but those are some of the things on the horizon. Yeah. Um, after a Jew has died, are they allowed to trans- transplant their vital organs? Because I thought they needed them for the resurrection. Of no, the resurrection is a. Qu- yeah, the answer is like this a Jew can give an organ to save someone else's life, even though you will not have that organ for the resurrection. The concept is that in the resurrection, the body will be reconstituted. What about people who never gave organs, but they were buried, they were burnt, or dis, dis, you know, dismembered, or yeah, not everybody merits to get buried. The Kabbalistic idea is that may be a more painful situation, but it's certainly not an obstruction to Tzchiyas Amesim. And therefore, that, that would not stop the, the idea of saving a life where we could save a life other than, yeah. How do you reconcile the significance of the fact that if in situations saying an organ oh I see the, the, that's easy the question here was how do you reconcile the extreme degree we go to collect all the body parts in a terrorist attack or, or so, with the idea of giving away a body part the idea is like this in those circumstances we're collecting all the body parts to bury them right we're not talking about saving anybody's life we're simply talking about the obligation to bury all of the body Taking a part of a body, either in that circumstance or any other, to save a life is a completely different issue. There we will transgress that, uh, that obligation. Such important to the fact that but I explained, I explained that no matter how important it is, if it's not one of the three cardinal sins in the Torah, we'll gladly override it to save a life. And it was, is that to save a life for anyone or any, or any Jewish person? No, the obligation to save life, especially in a country where the laws, yeah, the laws don't make any distinction. So we, we're not, we don't make any distinctions, yeah. So, what about, you, you made a touch on that, um, non-vital organs? Like yeah. No, this, uh, it's the questioner made a distinction in non-vital organs. We, we're not so, 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 we can give non-vital organs? Even though I didn't say that. You can give non-vital and vital organs to save a life. Well, the tchers amesim is not an issue when you can save a life. But can you give something like a cornea that's not... That okay, giving corneas, alright, that's a good question. What about giving a cornea? It's like this. Giving a cornea to save sight, okay... You're taking a cornea from a dead body in order to save the sight of somebody else. Now, now the question is like this. Mutilating the body to take the cornea, why did we say in this discussion that you can mutilate the body to save a life? The question is, is saving somebody's eyesight saving their life? You hear the question? Our authorities have ruled that a blind person is in danger of their life. Adic- enough that saving their sight by a cornea transplant is considered saving their life. And therefore we rule like this, that if a person is blind, blind means of course they'll see light if their cornea is badly scarred, but they cannot see, uh, they might not be able to see in a, in, a, in a functional, meaningful way. If you can restore their sight by taking a cornea, you may in fact save their life, because now they won't fall down a flight of stairs that they didn't see, and therefore we rule that taking the cornea is okay. Especially since taking a cornea is very, very slightly mutilating. 
The cornea is such a thin layer of cells that after it's been removed, you cannot see the difference and the eyes will be closed. So after the cornea has been stripped and the eyes are closed, it's not a visible mutilation of the body and that's a much more lenient category. Okay? It's important to know that the cornea should be taken without the eye being removed. The old way, old way that this used to be done was the whole eye was enucleated and then in the lab, they would strip the cornea off the eye. That is much more mutilating, obviously. And now uh, the post scheme, uh, yeah, would do for, uh, it, for Jews, it should certainly be done. And rather than the whole eye be taken, is the eye should be left in, in where it is, and the cornea is simply removed from the eye. That is much less mutilating. The second question that arises is, is saving the sight of one eye, where the person who can see in the other eye, is that also considered saving life? You see, if a person's walking around with one eye in which they can see, and the other eye is badly scarred, the cornea is scarred, they cannot see, that person is much less likely to fall down a flight of stairs than the person who can't see at all. Are you saving their life by taking... You, you understand the question? Here again, when it is done, I'm not giving you a bottom line ruling, you have to ask your own on the lucky authorities, but since there is minimal mutilation, and since it will not be seen because the eye will be closed, and it's not, etc., it's a much more lenient situation than taking. The same applies to needling fetal brains. You know, research is being done today where a needle is put into the brain of a stillborn child or an aborted pregnancy fetus, where they, they suck it through the needle certain areas of the brain, hoping to get cells that could be used in Parkinson's disease treatment or research, okay? That again is much more lenient because the mutilation is not a visible... Do you understand? Putting a, putting a needle in is not a gross mutilation of the body. It's also in a more lenient category. So that's with regard to organs like... with far parts of the body like... Also in a military situation, the laws are different. In Israel, for example, where skin is harvested because soldiers might get burnt and need the skin, even if we don't have an immediately burned soldier now, but we're banking it, okay, for somebody who's very likely to get injured or burnt particularly military situation, also these are much more lenient, much more lenient questions where we'll do things like that, okay? The laws of the military situation raise other issues, yeah. Oh, you said before, suicide is, uh, is forbidden as a sin. Yeah. But, on the significant percentage of people who commit suicide, yeah. suffering from clinical depression, Certainly, they don't I would see any way out yes. in the hole. Yes. They don't want to go. That doesn't mean a lot. They can't see any way out. Absolutely. Is that it by and proper that they should be punished in the next world? For that, I'm not, so we're not handing out punishment. Let's get this clear. The question here was like this. Yeah, let's get this clear. A person who commits suicide, we said it's forbidden, okay, because it is taking of a life, in this case, a life that is entrusted to you very much to, to God. The question here was, aren't most people who commit suicide so disturbed that they may be very much diminished in their responsibility or maybe even completely diminished? The answer is, in fact, halakhically, we assume that the person has such diminished responsibility that we don't apply any so-called punishments. For example, a person who committed suicide in a culpable fashion would not be buried in the normal cemetery. We would not mourn for them. We would not say eulogies for them. We'd handle them very, very differently because of the sin. However, who is to say that this person was culpable? Maybe they were so morbidly depressed or even so psychotically um, ill that they took their life, okay, and therefore they're not culpable at all. The default assumption we make is, generally speaking, we don't apply those laws today. We assume that the person was in a category yeah, where they were not capable of really making a thing, and we don't do that. In the next world, you may be sure, yeah, the, the, the question of fairness and handing out punishment by us is a question of doubt. In the next world, you may be sure that it's fair. God's not going to punish anybody in the next world for doing anything that he couldn't have done otherwise. Yeah? Get, don't get me wrong. Depression doesn't mean that it makes it allowed. It just may diminish the responsibility and somebody may be so ill that they may not even have the ability otherwise. Punishment in the next world is going to be handed out in proportion to guilt. Ah, it's not me who's handing out the punishment. Are you with me? Yes, we do regard. The bottom line answer to your question is in most practical circumstances we do regard suicide as having been in a situation of such extreme, uh, um, such extreme psychological pressure that we are not jumping in to start judging the person as... Um, so That's called prohibiting it. Yeah. No, 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 no. Again, again. Let me ask you a question. Listen, listen carefully. Is murder prohibited? Yes. Yes. Is it reasonable to be prohibited? Listen, listen, listen. Okay. What about a person who is so psychotically depressed or so detached from reality that they were responsible for their murder? Are you going to tell me what's the point in prohibiting it? It's prohibited because it's a terrible spiritual thing to do. If the person unfortunately did it because they were in a very extreme mental state, yeah, it's still a tragedy. 
the person who takes their own life in an extreme mental state, also a great tragedy. Do you understand? It doesn't become permitted. Yeah, lo- next question. Yeah. Is it, isn't, it, isn't there something that Hashem will never give you a test which you can't pass? So, like, if you were that psychotic, then you right. couldn't really say it was totally not your fault because it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have happened. Dude, I think you're making an error. If you follow through the principle that God would never give you a test that you could not succeed in, and somebody killed themselves, that does not mean they could have succeeded in not killing themselves. Maybe that wasn't their test. You get it? It doesn't mean that. It could be, yeah, maybe their test was to put it off a day or a week. Who knows? You don't, I don't know. You're talking about psycho- psychotic means out of touch with reality. Some psychotic people leap for buildings think they're going to fly. Are you with me? Yeah. So, before you say God doesn't give you a test you couldn't, carry, you couldn't uh, succeed in, you have to know exactly what test is giving you. Are you. Are you clear? Once you know what the test is accurately, yes, you could pass that test. But not always you or me can judge other people's tests and know whether they are within the ambit of what's possible for that person. That's a different issue. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, let's... Yeah. 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 Well, that's what that lady asked. The neshama leaves the body at the point of death. And that is defined halachically. Okay? So the neshama has left the body, irretrievably will not come back in again, when they're dead. When are they dead? The majority of our halachic authorities hold when the heart and breathing stops. And as I said to you, some say when the brainstem has ceased functioning, that's good enough. That's the argument. Yeah? Is there a significant change in a recipient of a heart? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I I think what you're getting at is when you transplant a heart, does the personality change because they're getting somebody else's heart? There's no real way of measuring that. The truth is that people after heart transplantation, you realize yourself, even if the organ made no change spiritually, they've been through such a massive experience that you wouldn't be surprised, okay, if they went through some changes. Added to which is the complication, the very real complication, that in bypass uh, uh, um, surgery, when the heart is stopped, or in this case removed from the body, there are often very, very significant brain changes. Not because of the spiritual element of the heart, but because it's, it's, still, it's still a debated concept in medicine, exactly what is responsible for the brain changes. But many people who go through, for example, coronary bypass surgery, where no heart is transplanted, but the heart is stopped during the surgery, there's two different types. One this modern technique actually operates on coronary arteries without stopping the heart. There's one possibility of doing that. But where the heart is stopped, during surgery and restarted afterwards and the circulation is maintained on bypass cardiopulmonary bypass there are very significant brain changes that take place afterwards it's thought to be either to microemboli or due to um, inadequate there are different theories about why it happens but it often takes quite a while for the person's personality to recover afterwards so we would really have no way of measuring but if you, what you mean spiritually do they now take on some of the characteristics of the person yes. whose heart it was yes. that's a very interesting kind of science fiction spiritual type question we have no way of really Kabbalah, Kabbalah does not Kabbalah talk explicitly no about no, it doesn't talk explicitly about heart transplant surgery uh, in this way the Kabbalah, the, 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 there is a verse that says that when the Mashiach comes, maybe we'll finish with this here. The verse says, when the Mashiach comes, it says, kemis leva even. I will take away from you the heart of stone. I will give you a heart of flesh. That's what it says. Okay? I will take away from you the heart of stone, which is what we have now, and I will give you a heart of flesh. This is not talking, you might think it's talking about calcific aortic stenosis, you know, a condition in which the, the heart becomes really stony. It's not talking about that. It's talking about a spiritual concept of our having a, um, a stony heart, meaning we spiritually very insensitive, and we will get a flesh heart, which means we'll become very sensitive when the Mashiach comes. It's a different, a different spiritual issue, which is a fantastic subject to talk about. In fact, the deep sources say when the Mashiach comes, people will start crying, you know that? Mashiach comes, it says, I'll finish with this here. It says, when the Mashiach comes, the Safta Haaretz Mishpachos Mishpachos, the Jewish families will sit down and start crying. Why? For all that they suffered and all that they lost. But the question is, why cry when the Mashiach comes? That's when it's happy. Everybody's got together again. Everything's fine. The dead are being revived. But Simcha Vasman used to say, the reason is like this. As we go through history, Hashem gives us a heart of stone. The reason He gives us a heart of stone is because if we had a heart of flesh, we couldn't cope, we wouldn't survive wouldn't survive. If you knew what happened to one Jewish child 60 years ago in Europe, if you really understood what happened to that child, let alone his whole family, let alone millions, he would never sleep again at night. 
You'd, you'd be so traumatized to think what human beings could do to other human beings for no reason other than that they happen to have an, a, a name called Jewish, yeah? that they could do those things, you would never sleep again. Therefore, what happens is Hashem gives you a heart of stone and you go through tragedies in life and, it, it, and, and somehow you get, you get adjusted. Somehow. Rav Simcha used to give the example of the Ponovich Arov. His wife and ten children were killed. Wife and ten children. And he survived. And he came to Ponovich and he said, we're going to build the biggest yeshiva in the world in this place. People thought he was raving. People thought the tragedy and the trauma had so affected his mind that he was raving. In fact, he wasn't raving. He, re- he rebuilt and he rebuilt a family and he rebuilt a great yeshiva. So Rav Simcha used to say, how could a person do that? How did it? His wife and ten children were brutally killed, and the man somehow picks himself up and carries on. Said of Simcha, because God gives us a heart of stone. And he gives us a heart of stone not out of cruelty, but out of kindness. You're given a heart of stone so you don't feel that pain, so you can carry on and you can function. But when the Mashiach comes and you don't need a heart of stone anymore, because those things aren't going to happen anymore, then he's going to take away the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and that's when the crying will begin. Okay, because then we'll be human again. Okay, we're going to stop here. Next week, Yemitz Hashem will deal with the question of living donor transplants. I'd like to discuss the recipient factors and some of the donor factors.